But wait, that's not even the worst bit. Above that, we've got smoking seaweed. Is it legal? <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Shark Bites, the best place online for you to get your shark fix. I bet you thought you were only getting two movie commentaries this season, didn't you? Well, if you did think that, then you'd be wrong because we're back again with another shark film for you. Kind of. Today's movie commentary has been suggested by loads of you in the previous video's comments, so I figured I had to do it for you. It grossed over $371 million worldwide and stars some of the film industry's biggest names, including Will Smith, Renny Zellweger, and Robert De Niro. Saying that though, it got completely shredded by the film critics and audience viewers at the time and has a measly score of 36% on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, I should say this is obviously an animated film, so it's gonna be slightly different to our previous movie commentaries here on Shark Bites, but there are still some marine biology and sharky things that I can mention, although I'm going to tentatively ask you to take it with a pinch of salt. It's also going to be a little bit shorter than our previous movie commentaries because, of course, again, it's an animated film. It's the end of season two. Give me a break, guys. I'm not going to give you a spoiler warning for this one because if you haven't seen Shark Tale by now, then you were probably not going to watch it anyway. It's been out for 17 years, everyone. Come on. Anyway, grab yourselves your favorite beverage, sit back, relax, and enjoy this movie commentary of Shark Tale with a real-life shark scientist. I can't help but completely love the soundtrack to this film. It's awesome. <laughs> Anyway, starting the film here with Oscar, who I'm pretty sure is a blue streaked cleaner ass working at the whale car wash. I mean, it's kind of a fun depiction of this because cleaner ass do clean a bunch of different marine species. I guess it's normally other fish species to be fair, but it can also be marine reptiles like sea turtles. It can be whales like we're seeing here. I'm pretty sure cleaner ass also clean sharks. So scientifically speaking, we're off to a pretty good start. So I actually never realized this when I was a kid watching this film, but this is supposed to be the shipwreck of the Titanic. And this is where the mafia shark family has decided to live. Again though, this is actually somewhat accurate here. And sharks really do hang around shipwrecks. I'm pretty sure there was a citizen science study done a few years back specifically looking into this. The study that I'm referring to here showed that grey nurse sharks, otherwise known as sand tiger sharks, displayed site fidelity, which is the tendency to return to a specific area around shipwrecks. Again, scientists aren't 100% sure why grey nurse sharks do this, but it might be an important rest stop area for the sharks during migrations, or it could be playing a role in mating. Cheeky grey nurse sharks. That I've lived my life for my sons, raising them and protecting them. You're the best. He's the best, right? Them. Am I right or am I wrong? Science. Huh? Am I right? It's all been to, right. prepa to prepare them. Sorry. Yeah, it's all right. For the day they run the reef. Okay, so this isn't quite right for great white sharks. Don Lino here is saying that he's been raising and teaching his sons, but there are no sharks that do this. When shark pups are born, they're completely independent and have to fend for themselves straight away. There's no parental care whatsoever. I mean, this doesn't make shark mothers bad necessarily. Sharks generally will invest in their offspring massively before they're born, but not after. So much energy goes into ensuring those pups basically have the internal resources to survive those first initial few days. That is until they can find a safe feeding ground where they can fend for themselves. Introducing Lola the gold digger here, and I actually did some digging myself, and she's supposed to be a lionfish. <laughs> so this is probably one of the worst depictions of a lionfish that I've ever seen. I mean, other than her coloration, maybe, but that's about it. Lionfish are pretty evil though, to be fair, so I suppose they got that right. In the real world, Lola here would be eating all of the baby fish. Dark. So after losing all the money on Lucky Day in the seahorse race, Oscar here gets taken out into the deep to be tortured by these jellyfish. They're talking here about why their stings don't work on each other, which again is pretty accurate from a marine biology perspective. Jellyfish can sting other jellyfish, but that's usually when those jellies are hunting another jelly species. Jellyfish of the same species can't sting each other. Random jellyfish fact there for you all. Frankie, in a horrific case of wrong place, wrong time, manages to somehow get crushed by a dropped anchor here. And as ridiculous as this may seem, this actually has happened on a previous occasion. Kind of. 
back when I was writing my research paper on shark entanglement, I actually stumbled across an account in the literature that said a basking shark had become entangled in something known as a parachute anchor and eventually died as a result of that entanglement. Parachute anchors, which look like this, are used by ships to slow themselves down. They're essentially like sea brakes, basically. Although not a true anchor, like in the case of Frankie here, a form of anchor did once kill a shark. Tentative link, I know. <coughs> Lenny, is that you? I'm here, Frankie. Come closer. Yes, what is it? I'm so cold. That's just because we're cold-blooded. Okay, so I like the joke here, but Frankie and Lenny are great white sharks, so this isn't quite true. Most sharks are indeed cold-blooded, which is, in essence, ectothermy, meaning they have no control over their internal body temperature, but the entire Lamnidae family of sharks, which includes the great whites, are actually heterothermic which is a mix of ectothermy and endothermy. This means that even in cold water, great whites can raise their body temperature higher than that of the surrounding water. It's basically due to a fancy system they have in their bodies called a countercurrent heat exchange. Their veins and arteries carry blood in opposite directions and that allows efficient transfer of metabolic heat. I bet you didn't think you'd be heading back to school biology class when you started this episode. <laughs> After taking credit for the death of Frankie, Oscar dons the title Shark Slayer and gets a load of media attention and brand deals, but I just wanted to pause it here on this magazine. <laughs> okay, okay, so first up, we've got OJ Shrimpson. Come on, man, I was not even there, <laughs> which is utterly outrageous how they've managed to spoon that in there. But wait, that's not even the worst bit. Above that, we've got smoking seaweed. Is it legal? <laughs> And then look at Oscar's face. Look at his face. <laughs> DreamWorks Animation, we were children. This is not okay. <laughs> I want to get high, so high. Okay, I will tell you. I'm... <clears throat> I'm, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> So Lenny here admits to Oscar that he's actually a vegetarian, which you may think is ridiculous for a shark species, but strangely, it's almost true for a certain shark species. The shark species I'm referring to is called the bonnethead shark, which is in the hammerhead family, and it's actually the first known omnivorous shark. A study on this shark species found that approximately 60% of its diet was actually seagrass, and the bonnetheads actually digest this seagrass, which is then being used to help build and maintain their bodies. They do also feed on small fishes and crustaceans, making them true flexitarians. So don't worry, Lenny, you're not on your own. So we join this big meeting here between the shark slayer and the underwater mafia, and we can see all the henchmen of Don Lino sitting around this table. So we've got hammerheads, Looks like a couple of tiger sharks, maybe. And then we've also got killer whales. But from a food chain perspective, this isn't quite right. Killer whales are actually predators of great white sharks. And there's a bunch of evidence out there that shows killer whales sit right at the top of the marine food chain. Great whites often completely leave an area when killer whales show up. And it's actually been shown that killer whales feed on the fatty livers of these great white sharks. So in reality, they'd be the ones sitting at the top of the table. Lenny, after having to hold Angie in his mouth, can't keep it in and throws up. And then we get a great little shark film reference here with that number plate. That's actually the exact same number plate that Hooper pulls out of the tiger shark's stomach in Jaws. And it's also the same one that's pulled out of the teeth of the tiger shark from Deep Blue Sea. 007 Louisiana number plate. Love that. Anyway, after the throwing up incident, we see Lenny here wiping down his tongue. And this is a question I get asked all the time, do sharks have tongues? Well, the answer is yes, they do have tongues. They're known as basials in sharks, but for most shark species, they serve little to no function other than supporting that mouth and gill region. Now, that is definitely a fact that you can impress your friends with. End of the film here, where we get a pretty realistic Missy Elliott and Christina Aguilera in fish and jellyfish form singing us out. Don Nino accepts Lenny for who he is and Oscar gets the car wash and the girl despite his morally questionable actions throughout the film. <laughs> and there we go, folks. That was Shark Tale. So I actually can't help but enjoy this film. It's got that element of childhood nostalgia for me. So I think that automatically helps me enjoy it maybe more than someone else who didn't grow up with the film. I know it got terrible reviews, but I liked it and still do. I mean, at the very least, it's got a pretty awesome soundtrack. Now, in terms of the shark science and marine biology behind the film, they definitely got a lot of things right about sharks, but I'm not entirely sure whether that was just down to chance. 
a few things they did get wrong, the great whites caring for their offspring, the cold-blooded stuff, and then the killer whales, but it's an animated film, so they're off the hook from me. So for realism, I'm going right down the middle with a five out of 10, and then for overall entertainment, it's gotta be a seven. What do you think of my ratings and where does Shark Tale fit in your all-time favorite shark films? I wanna hear all your thoughts in the comments below. And with that, we come to the end of season two here on Shark Bites. Again, I've had so much fun making all these videos for you and I really hope that you've enjoyed them as well. Have no fear though, I'll hopefully be uploading the odd Shark Bites short for you all to enjoy and we'll be back for the start of season three before you know it. Once again, I'd be so grateful if you could share Shark Bites with anyone who you think might enjoy it. And please do keep joining the discussion in the comment section of the videos. And don't forget to turn that notifications bell on so that you don't miss out when season three starts. For the time being though, as always, if you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like and don't forget to subscribe to the Shark Bites channel below where you can stay up to date with all of our latest videos and the start of season three. However, until then, see you next time.